So we are in earning season in earnest, and it would be a failure on my part if we didn't get a preview of what's going on from Taylor from Life Goal Investments. Because again, he's a 10-year Wall Street veteran, and uh, he's the guy I go to for what's going on in the market. So Taylor, thank you for being here. Yeah, I'm excited to do this. Earnings season is like the uh, highlight reel of what's going on every single quarter. I always say this is like when your kid brings home their report card and you're, yeah. the, you're the parent as the investor and you go, all right, how did this little rug rat do this quarter? There you go. So I want to talk about kind of four big buckets generally. Uh, we'll do big banks first. We'll do yep. regional banks second. We'll do tech, kind of the magnificent seven. Anybody else you want to talk about? And then we'll do a catch-all for everybody else. So first, big banks. What did you see when the big banks reported? Yeah, big banks are are benefiting from this net interest margin, you know, world that we're in right now, where they're yeah. paying out. You know, you think about a, a J.P. Morgan, right? Chase Bank, Chase Bank is paying out, you know, pennies on interest rates, and then they're investing on the back end in T bills and whatever it might be, rolling five percent, five and a third percent, something like that. Like that <laughs> is a like profitable that. environment for a big bank. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Yeah, the big banks were again. That's just not where the story is. Um, Correct. Correct. You know, when I when I looked at the big banks, I think the only one that was kind of interesting to me, and you brought this to my attention, so I looked for it on purpose because of you, uh, was Bank of America, yep. and they're just large, um, lo you know, unearned or unrecognized loss on their bond portfolio. That was kind of shocking. Yeah. So what they did was Brian Moynihan, and and uh, he, he's on our microscope right now, and Jamie Dimon put him under that microscope yeah. as a competitor because Jamie Dimon pointed out and said, hey, everyone, go look at Bank of America's balance sheet because what they did was they extended duration on their bonds. So they went instead of buying six-month treasury bills or three-month treasury bills, they went out and bought long-duration 10, 20-year bonds. And obviously, that has been a brutal, brutal place to be invested as interest rates have continued to to persist higher, right? The 10-year touch 10%. I'm sorry, the 10-year touch 5%. And as bond rate goes up, bond prices come down. And so that's what they've realized or unrealized, I guess is a better put. Yeah, unrealized loss. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. They've realized it unrealized. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So if, if the big banks aren't the story, I guess that means the regional banks are the story. And there have been some ugly numbers from the there regional have. banks. There have. Yeah, the, the, the Federal Reserve and, and kind of their policy and the Treasury at large and their policy has backed regional banks kind of into a corner. So they have not made the overarching sweeping comment that if a bank goes under, we will back them. But the market perceives that as, OK, question mark around regional banks that aren't systemically important. No question mark around Chase. Chase is going to be bailed out. JP Morgan will be bailed out if something happens to them. So then what happens is person that's the depositor looks at this and perceives that as Chase is safe, regional banks potentially aren't safe. So the knock-on conclusion of what then winds up happening is regional banks then have to increase what they're paying out on deposits to kind of bring customers over and maintain them there and say, listen, you might be taking a little bit of risk here, but look at the reward that we're paying you on your savings rates, whereas Chase Bank is paying you literally nothing. And then all of a sudden, that net interest margin between what they're paying on their savings and what they're actually getting on the back end via loans, via bonds, whatever it is, those big banks are really wide. But all of a sudden, those regional banks are paying 4% on savings rates. And all of a sudden, that net interest margin is razor, razor thin. And you can tell what's going on in regional banks. We talked about this on the last episode briefly, looking at the KRE index. That is the regional bank index and it is on the mat, on the floor, has not gotten up off the floor. It's down about 40% this year. That, that's a rough number, so don't take that to the grave with you. But um, it's it's gotten a little pop back in the spring after SVB kind of settled in. And people said, okay, this isn't going to be a massive spiral event. And now they're trading back off again. Yeah, I mean, yeah, when I look at the regional banks, there's just, there's just no good news, right? Their income statement, net interest margin is where they get a lot of that not great, going the wrong way. Yep. Then you flip over to their balance sheet, cash deposits going the wrong way, right? Yep. Capital flight. Uh, yep. Then they're lending, right? The revenue side of their income statement, uh, not doing great because they can't lend, right? They, That's they it. Just, they don't want to lend. Uh, then their balance sheet, as far as assets, they're seeing more and more reserves for bad debt. They're going to have to extend and pretend. it's. There's going to be, there just has to be less regional banks in a year. They, we're going to have, well, I guess I'll call them shotgun marriages for lack of a yep. better term. 
Yep. Uh, organ organized by the Fed. I mean, just this quarter was dramatically worse than the previous one. Yeah, yeah, I, I I totally agree with you there. And to your point, it's not going to be outright bank failures because nobody wants a bank failure. But we do want to see things get more uh, sturdy on the banking front, and where that can take place is okay. Jamie Dimon can gobble them up. <laughs> that's yeah. that's the reality of what's playing out. And right now, the overall deposit rate for Chase, J Jamie Dimon's J.P. Morgan, is above the threshold of where it's supposed to be. I think it's 10% of the overall deposits mm -hmm. in the country, yep. but yeah. guess what? That can go higher in the event of necessity. And that's well, what, that's we what see. they did with their last acquisition. It was, Correct. Uh, it was an exception. Correct. Right? Yeah. So uh, in the, in times of emergencies, JP Morgan can get bigger. Well, Correct. if we just hit the banks, one doing okay, one getting smoked. What about the, the magnificent seven? What, uh, what have we seen from tech and tech in general? Yeah. So it's been a mixed bag, right? Some companies have done great. Some companies have not done great. And so you look at ones that have done great. Microsoft reported what seemingly was very strong earnings. And some of the AI type fairy dust actually seems like it might be coming to fruition a little bit. And they're actually seeing pick up and then the subscribership and membership for paid services when it comes to AI. And then you flip the script and you look at Google. Google was down 10% in a day this is like oh. the fourth or fifth largest company in the world. 10% in a day. The market cap movement on that is absolutely astronomical. And that yeah. is the other side of the equation where they had a lot of AI robust movement coming into this. Their stock was doing really well, even relative to the other Magnificent Seven. And now the market says, okay, show me. And you didn't show me what I wanted to see. And therefore, we're starting to knock off the top of that froth of where AI fairy dust had been sprinkled. If it's not come to fruition, they just haven't executed as well as Microsoft. Yeah. When I look at Amazon, Microsoft and Google, there seems to be a story around cloud. Yep. Right. And um, Google missed. Amazon and Microsoft exceeded, I believe. Correct. Correct. And right. the other thing that was interesting about Amazon was their, their advertisers. Advertising blew up. It was like yep. $2 billion or something. And again, think yep. about Amazon. They don't make money or very much money or on the stuff. But if they're starting to get additional profit streams like advertising on stuff. Yep. And that one's interesting, interesting to me, to be honest, because I would not have said that. I would not say that you've seen a pickup and obviously you have, right? I'm, I'm wrong, but I would not have said that Amazon's going to see a meaningful pickup in advertising spend. That's a pretty good traditional leading economic indicator to oh, say people sure. are willing to shell out money and the back end profits will come to fruition based on the strength of the economy. But that's what played out. Well, I mean, I actually think it's a, I actually think what's going on is we're seeing almost a switching cost. And what I mean by that is historically people have advertised on social media, right? Meta, um, yep. whatever they are, the, the other ones, a snap, you know, all these folks, yep. Yep. maybe people are going, why the hell are we doing that? Why don't we just go to the biggest retailer on the planet and advertise there? Because why not go there and why shop not? for toys? Exactly. You know you have a captive audience. This is like push versus pull marketing. Exactly. Pull marketing is, 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 you know, what Amazon's doing where they know you're there to shop. So therefore, yeah. retailers like just go, income, hey, I know right? people are here. Yeah. It's like, you know, advertising at the grocery store. You know people exactly. are there shopping as opposed yeah. to advertising on Instagram trying to draw them into the grocery store. Or that's exactly what I think. Right that's what I think is going on is Amazon is finally figured out how to, uh, in a grocery store that I, I worked in retail for over a decade or yep. I don't know, eight years and in capsule where it was at, that's where the biggest thing went on sale. That was the highest margin stuff went there. Yep. And I think Amazon has found a way to have in caps and it makes perfect sense, right? Why do you want to advertise on Instagram or TikTok or wherever where they have to get off that and go to somewhere else to buy something? Right. And I think Amazon might shock us and they may become one of the biggest advertisers, you know, profit centers on the planet here quickly. Yeah. If you're looking at an advertiser, you want the least amount of work done by yeah, the least consumer. friction. Yeah. Least yeah. friction, the least clicks, the least, you know, you want your sales funnel to be as short as possible. And if you're going directly to where that click is going to be a purchase, yeah. then, then that's, that's a great place to advertise. That's, that's the spot to be. But of course it won't be cheap. It'll also be very high profit for Amazon. So it makes Correct. perfect sense. Uh, we have what? I think we have two of the Magnificent Seven still to report. Apple this week, and I think NVIDIA is a couple of weeks out. They're like, you know. NVIDIA is actually out. in December. They're an off-cycle uh, reporter. Yeah. So NVIDIA is going to be an interesting one because, one, that's going to be a little later 
which it gives us a little more time for the economy to chew through what's going on. And what you'll see there is right now, the, maybe the ultimate commodity in the world are microprocessor chips, microprocessing yeah. chips, I should say. So, right. So just chips, semiconductors. And what you have is this rush to buy them. And so they're on back order, right? They're on back order because they can't keep up places like NVIDIA. So now people are double ordering saying, hey, when yeah. these become available, I want mine first so I can get ahead on AI and things like that, which they power. Does that back order backlog maintain if we get some more tough yeah. economic news along the way? And, yeah. and, and that's the big outstanding question. It's funny that they come as a late cycle entrant because it will give us a little more time to start to get an idea. And, and as you know, <laughs> not telling you anything you don't know, there's a lot of Hopium built into to NVIDIA, and they have delivered. They've delivered, so it's been. Uh, over, it's been I would argue over delivered. Correct, correct, so, and so that's far. why you've just seen that that you know that that stock price just shoot up so meaningfully. But do they continue to do that? And if they don't, you know what happens on the other side because of it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we do get a kind of sneak peek into an I NVIDIA. I don't know, little cousin or whatever. AMD, I think, is tomorrow. Yep. Um, you know, any thoughts on AMD and Apple as we you know kind of get into this week? It'll be interesting. So, I mean, I'm more interested in Apple, admittedly. Okay. Apple right. is the Titan, right? Just because it's the largest company in the world. Their market cap is now they've had a 15% regression. So it was 2.6 trillion, I believe. And now it's whatever that math equates to. Mm -hmm. um, so more in that 2 trillion ballpark, but that is a market driver. And so sure. we think about the sell-off that we've seen in the market. Largely that's predicated on moves and people like Apple, right? Every single index fund in the world owned a meaningful, meaningful portion of Apple. And so if that 6% holding inside that investment vehicle starts to move downward, it perpetuates a portfolio down much more than it does in something that might be a 0.6% weighting, which is okay. where a lot of holdings are. Yeah. Well, if I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about Tesla in the big seven. They obviously, I think, oh, yeah. reported two weeks ago and you and I were, uh, we, we missed last week. So any thoughts on the Tesla earnings? Yeah, I think what you're seeing with Tesla is just the fact that they're, coming in massively under market to try to sell cars and yeah. their profit margins just continue to get squeezed. Now they were out at, and I'm, I'm going to rough numbers here and don't hold me to these, but they were out at 20% margins somewhere in that ballpark, even North of that, I believe. And mm -hmm. now what they're doing is they're coming more in line with a traditional automaker. And what they're trying yeah. to do is just undercut EVs around the world and get their product to market. And for the first time, what you've seen now is Tesla actually has inventory on their website, mm -hmm. which is interesting because before it was always go on, pick what you want to order and order it. And it'll ship to you when they get done with it, which was always an interesting, like how long is my car going to be before it gets here? But now mm -hmm. you can go on and say, Hey, I want that gray car that has mm -hmm. the performance package, et cetera. And they're ready and they're built and they will ship immediately. And that's yeah. just something that, you know, you've had an inventory build there. It's very interesting. I mean, so uh, I actually read articles about EV because I think it was Ford. They basically said, hey, we're not going to invest in EV or we're going to delay $3 billion. GM said this. And then Mercedes. Merce that's the big one. Yep. Yeah. Mercedes basically said the EV market is brutal, uh, you know, pricing war, uh, yep. not sustainable. Like, yep. oh. Yep. So again, I think, I think Tesla's, uh, you know, trying to take out their competitors and reduce competition. A hundred percent. What Tesla has done will either be genius or it won't, right? That's, 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 that's Elon Musk in a nutshell. But Elon Musk made a really interesting business move years back. Mm -hmm. He open sourced their, 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 how they build a car. And he said to himself, I'm the incumbent right now. If someone thinks electric vehicle, they think Tesla. And therefore, I'm willing to open source this so we can have more batteries produced around the world. And then what we'll have is more charging points because more companies will be creating them, et cetera, and create this more systemic overall industry than where it was in the past. And he said, listen, I'm going to give up our technology, let other people build them exactly like we do if they want. And at the end of the day, I know people are going to come to us. And so now they're kind of going the opposite route where they're saying, okay, we, we actually encourage competition to again, create a more systemic industry. And now they're looking at this and saying, now we're going to go in and undercut the knees from all of our competitors that we wanted to get built at. And it'll be interesting because I don't know yet if there's enough EV infrastructure to have this be a premature move, 
right? So if we did have more companies and they didn't undercut on a price perspective, Tesla that is, and therefore there was more competition building, there would be more charge points. There would be more right. rural areas that now have charging stations, which don't have charging stations at the moment. And is this a premature move to undercut competitors and therefore the industry doesn't proliferate as much as it once would have? Yeah, it's going to be interesting to watch Tesla. It'll be a story either way. Uh, again, I'm not someone who plays a momentum stock, so I don't touch that one with the 10 foot pole. But let's talk about just other earnings, right? I saw McDonald's this morning came out, basically 8.8% .8 growth, global growth. Um, what's going on just generally with consumer stocks and other others that have reported? Yeah, I think what we're seeing is, is continued consumer strength, honestly. And it's something where at some point, you know, and, and this was long premature, the market said, hey, higher interest rates are going to affect consumers. And they have not yet to any meaningful degree. And it's interesting. Um, <laughs> this is a, a, a guilty confession, I guess. Um, we go to, with my family, we go to McDonald's once a month or so because they have an awesome playpen and the weather isn't always nice in, nice in the Northeast. So the kids run amok and it's amazing. We'll, we'll, we'll meet another family there. But what I've been shocked about is McDonald's isn't cheap. Yeah. You know, like we, we get, you know, sandwiches or whatever for the kids and it's like, you know, if there's five of us there, my family, well, four of us, right? The little one doesn't eat that stuff, obviously. But um, four of us there, it's a 42 43 $44 dinner. Yeah. And you're like, okay, that's that's not cheap, right? It used to be half that, not very long ago. And now it's seen this massive pickup. And how long is that sustainable? I don't know. They, they've done a good job recently by increasing margins. But will that sustain? And that's a broader story, too. Is Ken Chipotle, same, same story, Chipotle, same exact exactly story. Right. Exactly. Yeah, right. Chipotle, we used to we used to go there a lot because it was so cheap to, for us to literally spend less money and have dinner prepared for us as we're scrambling around. My wife works. We would go there and it would be seven dollars a burrito. Right. Now they're like twelve dollars a burrito. Like that is right. huge. Yeah. It is being very interesting uh, what's going on uh, in the economy with earnings again. I think so. Earnings for Q3. Is, have we had enough to kind of call earnings recession continues or we haven't had enough data yet? We're not there yet. Nope. Yeah. And we shouldn't see, we really shouldn't see another negative quarter of earnings. So the expectation okay. was, was negative 0.3 and almost every single time companies supersede expectations, yeah. right? So something like 78%, again, hold, don't hold me to that one, but that's historically what you have overcoming the hurdle. So if you have 78% overcoming their estimates, you're going to yeah. get a positive number, but at the end of the day, you look forward to next year, and, and we've talked about this, and I've shouted this number from the hilltops because I think it's so important. 12% earnings expectation is what expected out of the wow. S&P 500 next year. 12, right? So we're coming from negative to 12% next year. It's, it's, it's something where, again, these companies have to perform, or otherwise you're going to see stock compression. Yeah, very, very cool. Well, where can people find you, Taylor? Yeah, find us at Life Goal Investments on both Instagram and TikTok, putting out daily stuff. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, Michael.